stories. I'm, I'm just so honored to be in this company. Um, I spent five of the best years of my life as a caregiver. And um, my name's Diane Nagley, and my husband Rick was a patient of Dr. Rose's. And what started off as probably the nightmare of all times, as any cancer diagnosis is, and from what you've heard tonight, it's just incredible. I'm here to talk a little bit about what it's like to be watching someone go through that and some of the things that, uh, that pass through your mind. And uh, as you've heard so many times, folks have made uh, lemonade out of the lemons that they've been handed. And um, one of the objectives that Rick and I had was to laugh every day for five years. So he was given uh, 18 months. He was, uh, he was diagnosed as, as terminal. And, but he got five years out of the deal, and uh, a large part, thanks to Dr. Rosen. When Rick first got his diagnosis, uh, we went all over the country trying to find oncologists. We went everywhere, interviewing doctors, and we ended up at Sloan Kettering. And we are talking to the folks there, and uh, we were definitely candidates for some clinical trials because it was so advanced, and it was terminal anyway. I mean, Rick's standing line was whenever anything would go wrong, he'd say, well, what's it going to do, give me cancer? <laughs> <laughs> and the folks at Sloan Kettering said, well, if you're on the West Coast, the only person that you can possibly see is Lee Rosen. And so we did the same thing. Jumped on the plane, came out, and uh, spent the next several years with Lee, and uh, was embraced by the entire Premier Oncology family. So when you hear that a loved one has this diagnosis, and you're the caregiver, you know, you start doing a lot of research, as everybody's attested to, and you hear this incredible litany of side effects and, and just amazing things that are possibly going to happen to someone that you love, and you just go, how in God's green earth are we going to get through this? And then it reads like a horror movie. But at the end of the day, you just do it one step at a time. You end up looking back in your shock at the journey, but one step at a time, you get through so many things. And Rick probably, he was on chemo every day of his life for five years. And his motto was, if not A, then B. And we'd be going through some treatment for a while, and Dr. Rose would be able to tell that this was going to start reaching a point where it's no longer effective. And then he'd start prepping us for, all right, here's the next one we want to try. I've got this, this, and this. And Rick would say, OK, let's do it. Never missed a day of chemo in his life. And, and he went through all kinds of side effects, and, and most, of them, most of them were horrible. You know, he had horrible lymphedema, he had neuropathy, I mean, he had amazing, nasty side effects. Um, one day we went down to, to St. John's emergency room because he wasn't feeling too well, and uh, Lee met us down there, and he said, well, I'm glad you came in, Mr. Nagley, because you are exsanguinating. <laughs> You're just bleeding all over the place. It was pretty funny. He had to be there. <laughs> but some of the things that happened to him were, were fun side effects. Uh, he went through every hair side effect. He had the ones that made your hair turn white. He had the ones that made your hair fall out. And he finally got the one that, that made your hair get really thick and curly. And his beard grew, which had never grown in his life. And his eyebrows came in and his eyelashes were, you know, <laughs> and one day we were flying um, on a plane, we were sitting separately, and then the flight attendant comes over to me and she says, boy, that man over there has got beautiful eyes. And I said, yes, he does. And she said, is he an actor? And I said, well, no, but please go ask him if he is. So finally, he was getting so many eyes that he could just tell people, he said, well, I'm wearing makeup. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And he said, if I if I'd known that it was going to be this easy, I would have done it years ago because it really helped me meet women. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, eventually, was it on? Okay, thanks. Um, Dr. Rosen's toolbox became empty. There wasn't much more to do for him, for Rick. Um, he started improvising. I, I honestly, to this day, I think Lee was making stuff up. I really do. <laughs> and um, so we finally uh, got to a point where he was going to start a new clinical trial for something that was not approved for colon rectal cancer, which is what he had. And uh, in order to get the FDA to support it, in order to get the clinical authorized, he had to be completely 
had to get all the Avast and everything that he'd been on out of the system. So it required going cold turkey off of his chemo for three weeks. And so he did this for three weeks, and it just totally wore him down. Um, it was amazing how much that was actually really helping him. But uh, he was in such pain, he couldn't eat, couldn't do anything, and he wouldn't take any medicine for it. And he said, because I have to be able to tell them how this is working, and I've got to have a clear head. I mean, I have economy bottles of morphine at home, I, I still have them. <laughs> and, and he wouldn't touch them. He said, I have to keep a clear head so I can report to them how this new therapy is working. Otherwise, this is for nothing. So long story short, uh, we get to start that trial, and he'd worn himself so far down that he wasn't eligible now to start it. He just, uh, his values weren't in the right ranges. And uh, so Anne Marie and Dr. Rosen admitted him because he was such a mess, and um, uh, put him into St. John's, and um, it wore him down too much. Uh, he ended up dying shortly thereafter. And what this, what this brings me to is, is an appreciation for how much more we can do to help folks with, with giving greater access to therapy, greater access to different chemotherapy regimens, uh, looser requirements for the protocols, and just making things more available to folks. It would, it would be so much help. Um, you know, it seems that we are so constricted. And just letting folks like Dr. Rosen really pursue the research that they're so excellent at doing. Um, on a side note, uh, my sister uh, is in a similar situation. She's got uh, terminal brain cancer. And she survived breast cancer, totally unrelated to the brain cancer. But because that she had the pre-existing cancer, she's not eligible for anything. And so she's going off the grid. Um, she's going, uh, she's pursuing some very, very, very controversial remedies because nothing that's traditional is available to her. And, and I'm hopeful that uh, some of the work that's being done today and the work that, that Dr. Rosen is going to continue to dedicate himself to is going to alleviate some of that. So a couple final thoughts um, as a caregiver. Um, and I know, I know some of you folks have been in that role already. And I know some of you folks will be in that role someday. Um, don't forget that you don't have as much time as you think you do. You've got less time than you think. And, and also try and remember that um, the sound of your voice is one of the most strongest healing things that your loved one can listen to. Um, I'm often told that uh, even when you think people aren't conscious or aware anymore, they still they still could hear and they can recognize the sound of the voice of a loved one. And so don't forget that. And then finally, last thing, um, I think one of the biggest things a, a human being can do for another person is to honor them by listening to their stories. Thank you for honoring me tonight. Thank you.